it might not surprise you to learn that this was the home of a Victorian Prime Minister. It does look like the house of somebody born to rule. Knowsley Hall, here near Liverpool, is the ancestral home of the Stanley family, the Earls of Derby. And the Stanley family have been active in British public life and politics since the Wars of the Roses. <laughs> We're here because of the 14th Earl, three times Prime Minister and the longest serving leader of the Conservative Party. He oversaw the campaign to abolish slavery and gave many working class men the vote. But he always remained very much the aristocrat. The earldom takes its name from West Derby in nearby Liverpool. And parts of the hall here date to the Tudor period. But in the 18th century there was a major rebuilding programme and this grand facade was constructed. Let's go and take a look inside. Knowsley Hall is still owned by the Derby family. They host conferences and weddings here, and the estate is the home to a safari park. But during the 19th century, this was all very much the preserve of the aristocracy. They'd spend the season in London and then decamp here to entertain at their country seat. This is the state dining room, the grandest room at Knowsley, and these imposing portraits express the power and prestige of the family. The 12th Earl founded the Epsom Derby, and by the time his grandson, Edward Smith Stanley, was born in 1799, the Derbys owned 60,000 acres in Lancashire. The family motto is sans changer. The 14th Earl's career was to disprove that. He started his political life as a Whig, but he was to switch parties, quit cabinets, and also spend 22 years as Conservative leader. And here's the 14th Earl as a young man. This portrait shows him on a grand tour to America. And what he saw there made him a fervent supporter of abolishing the slavery that continued to exist on plantations, long after the slave trade across the Atlantic had been made illegal. By the time Stanley, as he was then called, became colonial secretary in 1833, there were mass petitions calling for the abolition of slavery in British colonies. And it was Stanley who steered the abolition bill with its controversial compensation plan for slave owners through Parliament. Now this was a bold move for a man whose family owed so much of its wealth to landholdings in Liverpool, a key port in the old slave trade. The city was riven by conflict, but Stanley and his bill prevailed. Take a look at these. These are all ceremonial set squares and trowels, the sort of tools presented when foundation stones are laid. And all of these were presented to members of the Derby family at civic ceremonies throughout Lancashire. This cabinet, I think, shows the sort of relationship that existed between aristocratic families like the Derbys and the local community during the Victorian era. They really were lords of the manor. Stanley was hailed as the man who educated Ireland by setting up a national education system. But he also took a really hard line on law and order in Ireland, where he was known as Scorpion Stanley. Though a key figure in the famous Whig government that passed the Great Reform Act of 1832, giving many more people the vote, he later quit the party over their Irish policy and moved towards the Conservatives and Robert Peel. He later joined Peel's cabinet, but after four years he again quit, this time over plans to repeal the protectionist Corn Laws. This was a hugely controversial issue and it split the Conservative Party in two. Derby was a well-respected classicist. He even translated the uh, Iliad here into English. And he was also an extremely talented debater. 
and it was these debating skills combined with his rank which enabled him to rise through what remained of the Conservative Party. And by now, he had abandoned his seat in the House of Commons and had taken up a seat in the House of Lords. Away from the calm and order of Knowsley Hall, this was a turbulent time in British politics. Minority governments and the calls for voting reform getting ever louder. Society was being transformed by the Industrial Revolution, but many workers could not vote. Here is Derby's correspondence cabinet from his second term as Prime Minister. Pigeonholes for Queen Victoria and Israeli. After heading a short-lived minority administration in 1852, Derby returned as Prime Minister in 1858, but his government fell the following year. The 14th Earl was a keen shot and used to host big hunting parties here on his estate. In fact, they still hold them here today. One of his regular house guests was Benjamin Disraeli, although Disraeli wasn't that keen on the, the hunting and shooting, being more of a metropolitan type. But Derby's political partnership with Disraeli was to prove crucial for his third administration. Derby became Prime Minister for the third time in 1866, and by now there was no question of ignoring calls for voting reform. But once again, Derby headed a minority government. Fortunately for Derby, Disraeli was the leader of the Conservatives in the House of Commons, and Disraeli played a masterful political game in steering voting reform through Parliament. The 1867 Reform Act ended up enfranchising a very significant number of working class men for the first time. The campaign to enfranchise women, of course, was still in its infancy. Derby, though, wasn't totally enamoured of the Act, famously calling it a leap in the dark. The 1867 Reform Act was Derby's last major political achievement. Already in poor health, he was a martyr to gout. He stepped down as Prime Minister in 1868 and he died the following year. The story of the 14th Earl of Derby, a classicist whose personal odyssey spanned Victorian politics and a Prime Minister who gave the vote to many workers while remaining firmly an aristocrat. <laughs>